Okay, let's see what you guys think about these questions. Number one, comparing Antonio's pound of flesh to a slave. Does this make sense? So if we remember, we don't have to remember. We can jump straight to it for 190. Page 209, here Shylock is saying, if you can treat your slaves and your animals however you want to treat them because you own them, then I own Antonio's pound of flesh, so I can treat it however I want to. A few groups took this question. Uh, most of them agreed. Uh, and then I brought up the issue that if Shylock does take a pound of flesh from Antonio, Antonio is going to die. But in his comparison with slaves, line 92, he only says that you can use them in abject and slavish parts, which means treat them terribly and use them like slaves. He does not say you can kill your slaves. Uh, and it's true that in some kinds of slavery, specifically the older American form of slavery, owners and masters could kill their enslaved people. They probably wouldn't want to because American slaves were very valuable, um, but they could legally. However, in other kinds of slavery, for example, the slavery of ancient Greece, uh, you could not kill your slave. It was illegal. Uh, but in any case, most groups still insisted that Shylock is correct because the question is not about killing slaves or Antonio. The question is only about that one pound of flesh. What happens after that is not related to the legal question, which again is basically true. That's why they're in court because and everybody agrees that the contract is valid and that Shylock does own the pound of flesh. What they're debating is not whether it's a legal contract. They're debating whether the consequences of the contract are so terrible that they should find some way to stop the contract. Um, and so this question, as one group discovered, this question is linked to question three. Should you do a little wrong in order to do a great right? And we'll get to that question a bit later. Um, but as for question one, there's one other idea that some of you brought up, which is that in both slavery and in this case, there is a question of dehumanization. A slave does not have the full rights of a free person. They are treated as less than human. And if we think of Antonio only as the source of the pound of flesh, we are also thinking of him as less than human. Uh, and yet most of you still think this does not create a problem. Uh, some of you brought up the idea that Shylock also was not treated like a, a fully human person. Uh, so this is actually a very proportionate way of taking revenge. All of the suffering that Shylock suffered because of dehumanization, he is now forcing on Antonio and everybody else in the court who has to witness uh, the consequences. It's revenge using the exact same strategy as Shylock himself points out later in this passage. We talked about this last week, right? He's saying, um, you have treated me like this, therefore I will treat you the same, right? You, where was it? Something about Christians and mercy. 
You ask me to have mercy, but you also don't have mercy on me. Uh, can't find it, but we talked about this last week. Right, you say to have mercy, but if I follow what Christians actually do, they actually take revenge. Where is it? OK, uh, you can look for that in last week's lesson. Mm, yeah, I can't find it right now. OK, question two, uh, one group chose this question. The quality of mercy is not strained. In other words, you cannot force somebody to have mercy. The end of the lawsuit basically is Portia disguised as Balthazar, the lawyer, explains that yes, the contract is valid and Shylock does have a right to take one pound of flesh from Antonio, but there is another law that Shylock must follow. In Venice, it is illegal to kill somebody except for in a uh, war. So if Shylock kills Antonio, he should be punished as a murderer. Therefore, Shylock must cut a pound of flesh from Antonio, not one drop of blood more or less, not one inch of flesh more or less, and Antonio cannot die. If Antonio dies or if Shylock takes even a little bit more than one pound, then it is uh, he is attacking and killing Antonio and therefore should be punished. And that's the result of the lawsuit. So the question here is, does this result disprove the idea that you cannot force somebody to have mercy? And the group that chose this question believes that it does not disprove the idea. The idea still makes sense. And the reason they gave is because at the end of the lawsuit, the court gave Shylock a choice. You can insist on the pound of flesh and try your best not to take a little bit more than you are allowed to and also to not kill Antonio. Otherwise, if he dies or whatever, you will be punished as a murderer. Or you can uh, be punished by the court, pay a fine, give up your uh, daughter, et cetera, et cetera. And forgive Antonio. Like this is a terrible choice either way for Shylock. Let's see if we can find this. OK, so here on page 212, top right, Portia, as Balthasar says to Shylock, Therefore, prepare thee to cut off the flesh. Shed thou no blood, so make sure Antonio does not bleed. Nor cut thou less nor more, but just a pound of flesh. Make sure you don't cut more than or less than exactly one pound of flesh. If thou takest more or less than a just pound, be it but so much as makes it light or heavy in the substance or the division of the 20th part of one poor scruple. So even if the weight that you cut off is off by a little bit and it's not exactly one pound, right? Nay, if the scale do turn, but in the estimation of a hair, even if the difference is the weight of one hair, 
thou diest, you will die, and all thy goods are confiscated, and all of your wealth will belong to the state. Uh, because Shylock would be attacking Antonio outside the boundary offered him by the law, by his contract. Uh, and of course, Shylock refuses, right? He says, give me my principal and let me go. Fine, fine. You wanted to give me money, give me money and I'll, I'll, I'll go away. And Bassanio is ready to agree. I have it ready for thee. Here it is. But Portia, as the lawyer, reminds everybody, he hath refused it in the open court. We already asked him, would you be willing to take money instead of Antonio's pound of flesh? He has already refused. You can't go back on this decision. He shall have merely justice and his bond. Merely means only. So the only, since he has refused uh, penny uh, payment, the only thing he can have is the pound of flesh. But of course, this is a trap. If he tries, he will die. Uh, and then. So Shylock finally agrees to give up everything, right? If I can't have a penalty, if I can't have the pound of flesh, I don't want anything. Why? Then the devil give him good of it, which is like cursing. He's like, uh, whatever. I'll stay no longer question, so I'm not going to continue the lawsuit. And he starts to go, but Portia drags him back. She says, Terry Jew, Terry means wait. The law hath yet another hold on you, so there is another legal question on your head. It is enacted in the laws of Venice if it be proved against an alien that by direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen, the party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half his goods. The other half comes to the privy coffer of the state, and the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duke only against all other voice. Okay, lots of legal language. Basically what it means is if a non-citizen Shylock is not a citizen because he's not Christian. So if a non-citizen tries directly or indirectly to kill a citizen, then the victim, the supposed victim citizen, can take one half of the non-citizen's property, and the other half of the non-citizen's property will belong to the state. And the, the non-citizen should be punished to death unless the Duke forgives him. So, uh, Portia then has to prove that Shylock is trying to kill Antonio. So therefore she says, in which predicament? So in this situation, I say, thou stands. I think that this applies to your situation. For it appears by manifest proceeding, so by what we have all seen today, that indirectly and directly too, thou hast contrived against the very, the very life of the defendant, Antonio, and thou hast incurred the danger formerly by me rehearsed. So because cutting a pound of flesh from Antonio would kill him. Therefore, you, a non-citizen, have tried to kill a citizen, and therefore you should be punished by this law unless the Duke forgives you. So the conclusion, down therefore, and beg mercy of the Duke. So this whole situation, if we go back to this question, is the quality of mercy strained? Can you force somebody to have mercy? And it does seem like you can't, because in the result of the lawsuit, there is no chance for Shylock to give up and to forgive Antonio. 
they have already passed that question. Right, Portia says you have already refused it in open court, so now you cannot back out of your lawsuit. So they first give him the chance to have mercy, and when he freely refuses, then there come the many different punishments. So in the end, it does seem like the quality of mercy cannot be strained. Um, but even if Shylock were given the choice of accepting mercy or punishment, he could still freely choose punishment. He doesn't have to choose something in his own interest for his own benefit. Uh, so it seems like mercy is based on free choice and nothing can take away somebody's free will. Let's take a short break.
OK, before we move on to question three, I wanted to point out. Uh, in this passage. Portia refers to. Shylock. As an alien. Alien here does not mean from outer space. It means someone who is not a citizen. This use of the word alien we still use today in official legal language. A foreign alien is a non citizen even today. OK, question three to do a great right, do a little wrong. Does do you think this would still be just uh, a few groups took this question and they had opposite answers. One group thinks that you should not do a little wrong. It would make this unjust. Uh, and this is more in line with uh, non Christian ways of thinking about the law, whether it's Shylock who says that this is what the contract says. I deserve this. I own this. None of you can stop me. Or whether it's the ancient Roman saying do justice and let the heavens fall. Uh, uh, the idea is the law is the law. But there's another way of thinking about this, and the other group who took this question agreed with this other way, which is yes, you should follow the law, but if the results of the law are terrible, then you should also stop those results in that specific case. So it's not saying, uh, it, because this one contract is terrible, therefore Shylock should not be allowed to make any contracts. It's saying, therefore, this one specific contract should be stopped. And this way of thinking about the law comes from Christianity. Because uh, when Jesus appeared and started preaching his ideas, he said that uh, I am not throwing out the law, I am completing the law. And by the law, he's talking about the older Jewish ideas of justice. So if you remember from the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament is all about God making promises to the Jewish people and the Jewish people making promises to God. And if the Jewish people uh, break their promise, then God punishes them. Basically, that's the entire story of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Xingri, Jesus comes to forgive those who have broken the law. And he, he says that forgiveness is not throwing out the old law. It is completing the old law. So from the Christian perspective, mercy and forgiveness are also part of justice, are also part of the religious law. And so Christians believe that no matter what terrible things you have done in your life, if you can truly and honestly believe in Jesus and ask him to forgive you, he will forgive you and you will go to heaven after you die. So the idea that uh, Shylock's contract is so terrible that it has to be stopped even if he is legally correct. This is a Christian idea of the law and of morality. So really this question is uh, asking us and asking Balthazar to think about what kind of justice uh, does Balthazar want to do in this case? But in the end, Balthazar doesn't have to break the law. In fact, Balthazar takes another law about punishing non-citizens who attack citizens uh, in order to fulfill what the Christians of the play believe is just. Number four. Does Bassanio present a good argument for giving the ring away? One group chose this question. So the question here is, after Balthazar saves Antonio, uh, Bassanio and Antonio go to thank um, the lawyer Balthazar 
and they say in a very polite way, uh, is there anything we can do to thank you? Let's see if we find it. Here, OK, so this is page 213. Line 419. So Balthazar is about to leave, but Bassanio says. Uh, Dear sir, of force, I must attempt you further, so I'm, I have to keep you here. I have something more to say. Take some remembrance of us as a tribute. So take something from us to remember us as a token of thanks. Not as fee. So he's very careful to say, I'm not paying you for your service. I'm giving you something to thank you. Grant me two things, I pray you, not to deny me, so don't say no, and to pardon me. To pardon, why, why does he have to ask Balthazar to forgive him? Because he has kept Balthazar from leaving, right? Portia is about to leave and Bassanio stops her. So here he says, pardon me for keeping you here. Portia. You press me far and therefore I will yield. So you make a strong case and so I agree. Give me your gloves. I'll wear them for your sake. And so at this point. Uh, yeah, so give me your gloves. I'll wear them for your sake and for your love. I'll take this ring from you. So you should probably know that in uh, in Venice at that time, they wore gloves all day as a, as a sign of politeness. And so the ring is on the outside of the glove. So when Portia, as Balthazar, asks for Bassanio's gloves, then she sees the ring, and so she also asks for the ring. So like when, you can imagine this scene, right? Portia says, give me your gloves, and so Bassanio is preparing to take off his gloves like he removes the ring and as he's taking off the glove Portia then looks at the ring and says and for your love I'll take this ring from you the ring is already off of his finger at this point uh, so it's like it's in the balance for your love, love here does not mean romantic love, right? Love here means your affection, your positive emotions, in this case, your gratitude. I'll take this ring from you. Do not draw back your hand. Uh, so you can imagine when Balthazar mentions the ring and Bassanio is kind of like pulling back, not willing to give the ring. Do not draw back your hand. I'll take no more. This is the only thing I want, your gloves and your ring. And you in love shall not deny me this. So if you really are grateful, then you will not refuse. So this is uh, as a token of thanks. To thank Balthazar for saving Antonio. Uh, of course, Balthazar is Portia, so like Portia is just having fun. Very scary kind of flirting. Uh, but this is the ring that Bassanio had promised Portia he would never give away, would never lose. So Bassanio has some problem. This ring, good sir, alas, it is a trifle. It's very not valuable. It's a small thing. So Bassanio is he can't say no, right? So he's trying to convince Balthazar not to ask for the ring. I will not shame myself to give you this. It's not important enough to show how grateful I am. So if I give it to you, I would be ashamed. But Portia says, I will have nothing else but only this. Huh? She's starting to sound like Shylock. I will have nothing else but my bond. And now methinks I have a mind to it. So now that you refuse, I insist I will have this ring. 
Uh, in the end, Bassanio can't refuse Balthazar and gives the ring away. The question is, when, Bal uh, when Bassanio goes home, 5 one two, 10, and Portia notices that the ring is, is gone, Bassanio has to explain why. And the question is, do you think the explanation is a good one? So this is on page 217, line uh, 210. So again, Portia is kind of like having fun with him, right? She says, I'll die for it, so on my life, I bet my life, but some woman had the ring. I bet you gave it to some woman. So here Bassanio is explaining, no, by my honor, madam, by my soul, no woman had it but a civil doctor, a lawyer, which, which means who, which did refuse 3,000 ducats of me and beg the ring. So I tried to give him 3,000 ducats, but the lawyer said no, he had to have the ring. The which I did deny him and suffered him to go displeased away. Even he that had held up the very life of my dear friend. So could I let this person who saved Antonio leave unhappy? What should I say, sweet lady? I was enforced to send it after him. I was beset with shame and courtesy. OK, so we should go back and look at this. I think I ended that too quickly. Uh, right, let's continue. Sorry about that. Uh, 213, last line. Balthazar says, I, I, wa I have to have the ring. Bassanio says, there's more depends on this than on the value. So this ring is more important to me than simply because of how valuable it is as a ring. It has a personal value, basically. Next page. The dearest ring in Venice will I give you and find it out by proclamation. Only for this, I pray you pardon me. So if you want a ring, I will ask all of Venice to give me the most valuable ring and I will give that to you. But this one ring, forgive me for not giving it to you. Proclamation means announcement. So he, he was going, he will announce and ask for the most valuable ring in Venice. Balthazar, I see, sir, you are liberal in offers. So you are willing to make grand promises that you do not plan to keep. You taught me first to beg, and now methinks you teach me how a beggar should be answered. So you made me beg for your ring, and now you're treating me like a beggar, not giving it to me. Bassanio, good sir, this ring was given me by my wife, and when she put it on, she made me vow that I should neither sell nor give nor lose it. So that's the reason, but look at how Balthazar answers. That excuse, excuse serves many men to save their gifts. So she's saying that's just an excuse. She doesn't believe him. And if your wife be not a mad woman, and just means if, so this is if, if your wife be not a mad woman and know how well I have deserved this ring, she would not hold out enemy forever for giving it to me. So that's just an excuse. If you tell your wife the true reason you give it away, she would not be against you. She would not be angry at you forever. Well, peace be with you, which means goodbye. Exeunt Portia and Nerissa. So the two women leave the stage. Antonio, my Lord Bassanio, let him have the ring. Let his deservings and my love withal be valued against your wife's commandment. So you should give him the ring. And my affection, my friendship, 
and his Balthazar's um, service are more valuable than your wife's promise. And Bassanio agrees. Go, Gratiano, run and overtake him. Give him the ring and bring him, if thou canst, unto Antonio's house. So, you know, once he loses the ring, he has to be able to explain to Portia what happened. So he asks Gratiano to try to bring Balthazar to Antonio's house, I guess, so that they can then take the lawyer with them back to Portia and let the lawyer explain to Portia what happened. Not knowing, of course, that Balthazar just is Portia, the same person. OK, so that's what happens. He refuses the, uh, to give the ring, but later decides that, you know what, I should have given the ring, so I sent it after. So where were we? 210. <coughs> Begged the ring, the which I did deny him and suffered him to go displeased away. So I did refuse him. I did let him leave unhappy. Even he that had held up the very life of my dear friend. So even he today, we would say the very person, that person who had held up the very life, of, who had saved my friend's life. What should I say, sweet lady? I was enforced to send it after him. So, of course, nobody forced him, but he, he feels like he had no choice to send it after him. I was beset with shame and courtesy. So ashamed that he had let the lawyer go unhappy and courtesy here means the, the obligation of being polite. The duty of being polite. My honor would not let ingratitude so much besmear it. So I could not let ingratitude. Tarnish my honor to lessen my honor. Pardon me, good lady, for by these blessed candles of the night, had you been there, I think you would have begged the ring of me to give the worthy doctor. So if you were with me, you would also agree I should have given the ring to the lawyer. The whole thing is one long joke, right? Because she was there as the lawyer. Back to the question. Do you think this argument makes sense? So I did refuse to give him the ring, but when he left unhappy, my conscience basically did not let me uh, walk away. I had to give him the ring to show him my gratitude for saving the life of my friend. Uh, so one group took this question and they think that uh, this does not make sense. Right? OK, they're not listening, uh, but they think it does not make sense because a promise is a promise. Fasanio promised. Portia, he would not lose the ring no matter what, and no matter what includes this kind of situation. Um, the other perspective is that Antonio is not just a good friend or possibly secret lover. Antonio is the person who made it possible for Bassanio to marry Portia. He is their matchmaker. So not only uh, is it right for Bassanio to thank the lawyer for saving Antonio's life. It is also right for Portia to thank the lawyer for saving his life because without Antonio, she would not have Vasanio. And so in this sense, the fact that the lawyer saved Antonio's life is more important than the promise Bassanio made to his wife. Um, but in any case, the the audience and the reader of the play is not meant to think too hard about this question because it's all one big joke, right? Portia knows that she's torturing Bassanio. She's just having fun with him. 
The more interesting aspect of this question is, as I pointed out, the lawyer's insistence on the ring is similar to Shylock's insistence on the contract. It's like a reversal, it's a mirror. So after we have finished with the Shylock plot, uh, it has been resolved. As soon as that is over, Bassanio gets put into a new situation that looks very similar to the old situation. Right? A question of which one is, uh, like both options are bad options. The same for Shylock as well. Both options are, there is no perfect option. And yet in the moment, Shylock and Bassanio each have to choose one option. Um, it's a kind of, uh, it's a very interesting kind of comedy. It's kind of telling us that even though we have seen such a serious issue in this play, but in fact, this same issue can, this same situation can be turned into something light and funny. Uh, so why would Shakespeare do this? One reason might be because he was performing, he was writing this play to be performed in front of a Christian audience. I think I mentioned before that at that time it was illegal for Jewish people to move to England. So at the time of the play, Jewish people were still being discriminated against. And yet in this play, Shakespeare gives Shylock such great speeches, right? If you uh, hath not a Jewish uh, had hath not a Jew blood, if you prick him, does he not bleed? Uh, and also, everybody agrees that the contract was legally valid; that Shylock was right to demand one pound of flesh. So it's giving the Jewish character maybe more humanity than the audience is prepared for. So as, as we mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, it seems like Shakespeare might even be criticizing his audience for discriminating so seriously against Jewish people. But he's a playwright. You don't want your audience to be against your play. So maybe this is one way of letting the audience down slowly, like letting them slowly descend from their anger. It's like saying, um, you know, this serious issue and you are wrong to discriminate. But look, this same situation can happen between husband and wife also, and it doesn't have to be so serious. It's a question of uh, managing the audience's emotional response to the play. It's actually quite a brilliant thing to do. Uh, it's one reason why Shakespeare is the best of the 16th, 17th century playwrights. Like most other playwrights of Shakespeare's time would simply take one plot and just develop it all the way to the end. No transitions, no reversals, no surprises. But Shakespeare here gives us not one, but two surprises. The first surprise is that uh, Antonio loses all his money and has to go to court uh, with Shylock. And the second surprise is after that is resolved, the same situation happens again between Bassanio and Portia. Uh, really, uh, interesting playwright who can think of this kind of story. And finally, question five, uh, one, two groups took this question. The title of the play is The Merchant of Venice. Who is the title talking about? And is it a good title? So in this story, there are two merchants, right? Antonio and Shylock. So those are your two choices. Very interesting. One group chose Antonio, the other group chose Shylock. Mm -hmm. But both think that it's a good title. Because it is about these two men. If 
if the play were called The Merchants of Venice, it would be the best title. But it says The Merchant, one person. So we have to think about which person is it. Now, one group thinks it should be Shylock because he is the key person of the story. He is the person who gives Antonio, he, who lends Antonio money. He is the person who insists on taking one pound of flesh. He is the person who is punished in court. And also we have a story about his daughter running away with a Christian. He seems like the most important person. And the logic of the play revolves around the ideas of revenge and mercy. And the reason they think about revenge is because Shylock wants revenge for being discriminated against. So it does seem like Shylock is the most important person in the play. The merchant should refer to him. However, the other answer, Antonio, also makes sense. The story begins with Antonio, right? Why am I so sad? No idea. And then Bassanio goes to Antonio to uh, ask for money to go and pursue Portia. And then it is Antonio who loses all his money and therefore has to. Uh, it is Antonio who goes to Shylock to borrow money. It is Antonio who does not understand that Shylock is joking. He signs the contract of his own free will, and the rest of the play is about saving Antonio. So it seems like both of these people are very important to the play. If we had to choose one, who should it be? There is one key difference between Antonio and Shylock in this play. Antonio is closer to the protagonist, but Shylock is closer to the antagonist. In Chinese, we call this 主角跟反派. But really, we're not talking about hero and villain, good guy and bad guy. We're talking about the person who wants something is the protagonist, and the person who tries to stop the first person is the antagonist. Antonio uh, wants money for Bassanio, and he wants to live. Shylock prevent, tries to prevent Antonio from getting both of those things. Either, Antonio, he, either he does not give Antonio the money, or he gives Antonio the money and tries to kill Antonio. So money or life, one or the other. Shylock is the obstacle in this play. And it can be easy to forget this because most of the play is about Shylock wanting something. Um, but it's not something that he wants from the beginning. He insists on his contract because of things that have happened before. His insistence is a reaction to the events of the play. He is not the person to initiate the plot. Right? Shylock is reacting to what happens. He is not the person who starts the play, who starts the action of the play. Uh, so Antonio is closer to the protagonist and Shylock is closer to the antagonist. Therefore, the Merchant of Venice probably should refer to Antonio. It's just that we have a very vivid and colorful and memorable antagonist. Although really the, the main protagonist should be Bassanio because Bassanio is the guy who wants to marry Portia. He's the person who's trying to get something, in this case, a marriage. Um, but it's not called the friend of the merchant of Venice. It's called the merchant of Venice. OK, uh, do you have questions about these five? We have finished the play, so do you have questions about the merchant of Venice? Any questions at all? Great. So um, next I'm going to, to introduce the next play, but before that, some announcements. 
the makeup class will be on December 1. Previously, I said December 8, but there are no classrooms available on that day. So it will be on December 1. Uh, should be a Friday, right? Yes, Friday, Friday morning, 10, 10 to 12, third period, fourth period at EE102, room EE102. So this is a book time. 十月一号早上第三第四节在一一一零二. I know not everyone is available at that time, so if you cannot make it, it's fine. But if you are available, uh, please come and join me as we use the really big classroom to watch uh, the movie of The Tempest, Bao Feng Yu. Okay, next week we're going to watch the movie for Much Ado About Nothing. In Chinese, we call the, uh, the name of this play is Wu Shi Shen Fei. It is usually considered the first romantic comedy in English. Uh, so where did Shakespeare get his ideas about romantic comedies? He got them from Italy. Uh, so the story is about two couples. Uh, the first couple is Claudio and Hero. Hero is a woman. So Claudio comes back from, I guess, a war or something, and he meets Hero, the daughter of the governor of Messina, right? It says, Hero, Leonato's daughter, Leonato, governor of Messina. So Hero is a very important young lady. And Claudio falls in love with her and he tries to win her love. But the way that he tries is kind of weird and things go wrong and there are problems because it's a romantic comedy. The other couple are Benedict and Beatrice. These two people hate each other so badly. Every time they see each other, they argue. And they argue so much that you know they will end up together. But we know this because we're familiar with romantic comedies. At that time, uh, audiences in England did not expect this kind of thing. They did not expect a man and a woman who keep arguing to end up with each other. And that's part of uh, the interest of this play, to see how these two people go from enemies to lovers. Now, uh, it's called Much Ado About Nothing, first of all, because there are so many things that go wrong and like situations that did not have to happen. But there's another reason for this title. The word nothing in 16th century English is pronounced noting. And the word noting means observing or eavesdropping. Toting. Much of the play happens because somebody hears something they're not supposed to hear and they make the wrong conclusions and they do something stupid. Or somebody uh, hears something that they are supposed to hear and they take the right conclusions and something good happens. In other words, a lot of the plot moves forward not when people talk to each other, but when people talk and other people hear it. Um, so it's a very sideways kind of plot. Um, but in fact, the hardest part of reading this play will probably be the character of Dogberry. Dogberry is a constable in charge of the watch. What does that mean? So this is before the police. The police do not yet exist. So instead, at night, uh, some citizens will volunteer to make sure that people are kept safe. And these volunteers are called the watch. 
uh, or the full name is the night watch. And a constable is someone who is in charge of uh, one part of the night watch. So Dogberry, you can think of Dogberry as like uh, a kind of volunteer policeman. And he orders around uh, the other watchmen. So here the other watchman is represented by Virgis, Dogberry's partner. So Dogberry is the like the commander of this volunteer police. The difficulty of reading Dogberry's lines is that he has terrible English. He is a very uneducated person and he keeps on making mistakes with the English language. His grammar is terrible. His vocabulary keeps getting confused and mixed up. He will use one word when he means the other word. He will say the opposite of what he's trying to say. So most of the time these mistakes will be pointed out by the editor at the bottom of the page. So if something doesn't make sense, you can check the bottom of the page to see if Dogberry is making a mistake or if it's something that you need to check a dictionary for. Um, some of those mistakes are so terrible that even the editor doesn't know what he's saying and the editor says perhaps blah blah blah, which means he's not sure either. Um, but at least Dogberry is not a very important person. He's mostly there for comedy. Um, he plays, he does exactly one very important thing in the play. But other than that, um, he's not that important. Right, so you have the first watchman, second watchman. These are the uh, volunteer policemen that Dogberry can command and order around. Uh, and of course, in a Shakespeare play, we also have subplots. So like you have Don Pedro, who is the Prince of Aragon. This play takes place in Messina, which is located in Aragon, which is somewhere in Italy today. But again, Italy did not exist at that time. It was just a collection of small countries and small cities. So Don Pedro is Prince of Aragon, and then you have his brother, Don John, who is Don Pedro's bastard brother. Bastard is not an insult. Bastard means that he was born when his parents were not married. bastard. But uh, this usually means that this character is not very moral. He's not very, he's not a good guy, basically. Uh, so we can expect that some of the problems in the play will be caused by him and his followers, Baraccio and Conrad. OK, so I think that's most of what you need to know to read this play. A lot of the arguments are also quite fun. They are, they usually depend on uh, puns, shuang guan yu. So like maybe Benedict will say something and then Beatrice will make a pun uh, on what Benedict said in order to insult Benedict, something like that. Just a very interesting use of language in this play. Yeah, so next week we're going to watch the movie and then the week after that you have to read. What do you have to read? <clears throat> Much ado about nothing up to the end of act two, scene two. Right, so next week is the movie and then read up to the end of two, two. Uh, right, I'm going to pass out the handout and then when you, when you get the handout and you have signed in, you can leave. <laughs>